obviously, I do know something about failing, as you could see with the way I set up the presentation. So I'm going to have some learnings to, to like share with you today. So as you already know, my name is Patrick. I'm from 11-Bit Studios. You may be aware of our existence due to like This War of Mine, a game that we have released a few years back, or Frostpunk, another title of ours that we have released quite recently to a uh, like, mediocre success, I would say, but we are quite happy with the results so far. But that's not the topic of my like, presentation today. Today I'm going to tell you something about the marketing side of things, because in our studio I'm basically involved in all of the marketing things. And this is kind of boring usually, but for me it is quite satisfying. And I've got some things that I have learned along the way, and those are the things I would like to like share with you today, but because no one pays me for it, I am here for you as much as you are here for me. So I would like to start the presentation with kind of a quiz, kind of an interactive thingy, because in some books that I have learned and I have, uh, I, have, I have read, I've read two of them at most, but still, there were those guides on how to start the presentation and so on. So I know that like, starting with some interactive opener is a good thing to do. So I'm going to do that right now. So what I want to do is I'm going to show you a few slides presenting different games. And I would love you to tell me what is the common denominator for all of them? What is the one thing that connects those games? What is like something that is true for all of them? And all of those games are from 2017, as far as I am aware. So this is Cuphead, obviously, game number one. Uh, then we've got Hollow Knight, the second title. And then we've got Into the Bridge, an amazing game, but a different one. And those three games, what is the one thing that links them, one thing that connects them? Any ideas? Success. Absolutely. You have seen my slide before, right? No, you couldn't. I wrote it yesterday. But yeah, success. Exactly. This is something that we get hyped with. This is something that we crave for. And this is something that we like follow and try to analyze and learn something from it and so on and so forth. But at the same time, how many of those successful titles can we name? And my theory, and it is backed by data, is that a bunch at most. And at the same time, in 2017 only, there were more than 7,600 games released on Steam only, according to Steam Spy. So that data proves one thing and one thing only, that for every success story out there, there is a long line of games that failed or barely made it. And considering that ratio, unfortunately, there is a high risk and a high chance that your game will share the fate of those games from those long, long lines. And this is not due to the fact that your game is not good enough. Probably it is. But having good game is not enough anymore. And this is something I would like to discuss today. Okay, not having that presentation here, I'm going to have to like switch here. Okay, so our market, just as every other market out there, whether that is FMCG, automotive, whatever, there is a long spectrum to fall on between like a total failure and a total success, right? And marketing is all about like long-term planning and preventing the final, the ultimate failure. So even though day one success is very, very important for us as creators, as publishers, as developers, there is a bunch of things that you can actually do to stay afloat long term, even if you don't have this day one success. And some of those things you can do prior to your release and should do prior to your release. And some of those things should be considered like a must and an obligatory plan, uh, part of your plan post-release, as a post-release support of sort. And marketing is all about the kind of a recipe. It's all about how to prevent the failure, but also how to increase your efficiency from the business point of view, from the communication point of view, uh, and so on and so forth. So let's discuss a few things that are quite important, as our experience at least shows, on top of having a good game. Because this is something that I cannot be more like, focused on, that good game is absolutely, absolutely obligatory. Because 
you can do whatever you want to. You can try your hardest. And you can obtain some kind of a success initially. But if your game do not deliver long term, you are basically destined to fail. And this is something that will be like will appear in that presentation at least once or two times more. That good game is a must. But then on top of having good game, you have to cover few additional things, starting with data. Data and all the information that you can obtain from the market and use to your own advantage is absolutely crucial. Because to say that data is important, it's, it's like to say nothing. Data is crucial. Because the more you know, the better prepared you are, the better prepared you are, the bigger is your chance for the success that you crave for, right? And the common thing to do and the common mistake to make is to perceive your needs and to perceive your wants and basically to transfer your own personal perspective, a perspective of creator, onto the market as a whole. Because my opinion and my perception is that devs usually like to say that, well, okay, we create games that we would like to play. And from the design point of view, it is a to totally understandable approach because if you want something, if you like something, you know how to prepare it. You have this idea at the back of your head and you want to bring to that, that idea to life. But then from the marketing point of view and from the business point of view, it is not a valid approach. Maybe it is valid to some degree, but it is not valid like 100% because how strong is the category, the genre, the type your game belongs to, or how big is your potential audience out there that could be potentially interested in not only talking about your game, but also purchasing your game, right? Or how does your competitor, the co competition look like? And how is your con what is your condition in direct comparison to your competitors? Those are totally, totally valid questions to ask. Those are questions that you should ask at the beginning of your journey as a creator, then somewhat like somewhere in the middle and at the end of your journey as well. And there is a bunch of, a bunch of tools that you can use to your advantage, that you can use to obtain information that can be helpful with answering those questions. And obviously, one of the tools that you should start with is Steam Spy. Even though it is not as accurate right now as it used to be even a few weeks or a few months ago, it still can provide you with a bunch of like, helpful information and it's going to get more accurate and more efficient with time, I believe so. But then on top of Steam Spy, you've got social media monitoring tools, you've got media campaign tracking tools, you've got review aggregators, and you can obtain information from each and every of those platforms. You can use each and every of your tools, of those tools to your advantage, and then you can cross the data. Because crossing that data, you can get additional information and additional knowledge because having like the number of comments on Steam and the number of positive and negative reviews and comparing those to some titles that you know how they performed on the market, you can like predict what the sales are and whatnot. So it is a lot of work, but still it is a work that it is worth to invest in, if that makes sense. And then you've got campaign repos. There is a bunch of campaign case studies online that you can use, analyze, and learn from them. But for those, you have to just remember that most of those databases are not heavily covered when it comes to game dev as such. And even if there are some case studies, usually they come from the triple A area, so you can find some campaigns for Call of Duty and basically for Destiny and all of those titles that are heavy spenders or something, right? So they push a lot of money onto the market and they obtain high results and there is a value to it. There is something that you can learn from those campaigns, but you have to remember that not everything is applicable if you are an indie developer. Then there is your audience and the audience is very important from the design point of view, but from the business point of view as well because to like predict your potential success or basically the, con the future condition of your game, you have to think about if there is a like strong following in the particular category or genre that you are working on. So if you have like a 
point-and-click adventure game. You have to think if like people want point-and-click adventure games. If you have, if you have a first-person shooter, they probably want first-person shooter. But basically, you have to think about that. How many people can actually be interested in your game? in talking about your game, because talking about your game, creating a community, this is an important part. But then there is a difference between talking about the game and actually spending money. And there is this simple equation that you have to keep in mind, that your consumer base times the conversion ratio, because the conversion ratio means people that come to your product page versus people that actually buy your game. This is something that is quite predictable for particular categories, for particular genres. Basically, I can tell you that the average conversion ratio is not bigger than few percent. If it's four percent, you are good to go. So you have to think about that, right? So consumer base slash, uh, meaning times conversion ratio, times your pricing, because that heavily influences the, the amount of money that you're gonna get, versus the production cost plus marketing budget. So everything that you have already invested or you're gonna invest in the future, that gives you the potential profitability of your project, but there is another catch, another potential pitfall that you can fall into. And the name of that pitfall is advocates versus spenders. And the main tip I would like to give you here is do not confuse them with each other. Because for some genres, oh, spoiler, for some genres, for some categories, for some types of the game, we've got those vocal, highly engaged communities, but that doesn't mean that, those, that even though those genres are highly popular when it comes to like the social media side of things, when it comes to sales and it, when it comes to the business side of things, those genres can be quite tricky. And there is an example of ours of sort, and the example is BitCup. BitCup is a title that we have released like last year late spring, something like that, end of March, I suppose. And BitCup, are you familiar with BitCup? Any of you? Okay, some of you are, good. So for the rest of you, BitCup is a mixture of point and click adventure game with some kind of a time management game. So I would say that it is, it is a love child of Police Quest by Sierra back in the days, from back in the days, with papers please like experience of sort, right? And the game is really, really good. I really like the game. But as we have learned in the process, retro games, those pixel art retro games right now, they have a strong following, but the purchase intent for that type of an experience is not very, very high. So even though BitCup have delivered when it comes to the quality of the game, when it comes to all the aspects that are directly like in, uh, related to the design and to the whole production and product shaping of sort, BitCop has struggled at the beginning. Even though it had good reviews, even though it had like quite significant following online and whatnot, right? At the beginning, it has struggled. And don't get me wrong, right now we are happy with the, with, with, with the numbers. But it took a lot of effort from all the parties involved, meaning the design team, the, the, the developers of the game, the marketing team, the publishing team, all of us, we had to work our asses off to make that happen. Because BitCop is not an exception. The thing is that for retro games, we love to talk about them. We love to discuss them, we love to share some information about them, we love to watch some videos from back in the days and, back in the days and get hyped by those Amiga games and whatnot. But then, at the end of the day, we tend to spend our money for more modern types of experience, if I may say. And do not get me wrong, there is nothing wrong with that. This is what we do as people. We like to talk about things that we feel like that are close to our hearts of sort, but then when we think about, okay, what I'm gonna play today, I'm gonna play the newest Call of Duty or anything else. And that's totally fine. What I'm trying to tell you is when thinking about your marketing planning, where when like planning your business activities, try to pinpoint your vocal community, 
people that will follow you, people that will discuss your game, people that will share and spread information about your game, and then try to pinpoint the group that will actually spend money on your game and make the communication planning and prepare the communication planning basing that planning on the first group one while when it gets to predicting the sales and thinking about the business side of your things then think about the second one excluding the first one then can be then Kirby and probably there will be an overlap between those two, those, those two groups. But those two groups are not the same people, after all. And you have to be aware of that, because otherwise you can be quite disappointed. And it's better to be prepared than disappointed, obviously. And then there, there comes the whole matrix of what slash where slash when. So which platforms do you want to explore? To push your game to the market, but also to push the information to the market. Uh, how to reach your potential consumers, but because even though they are out there, different people are using different medias for different reasons and to obtain different results. So if you want to boost the hype for your game, where should you push your message to? You won't be able to like cover all of the fields because you don't have time, you don't have money, neither of us have, uh, has the, that, those things. So how to shape your communication to become appealing, to become understandable and to become attractive for your consumers. And this is like connected to, to the whole quite simple but still, still helpful matrix that I have prepared for the sake of the presentation. And obviously everything again starts with your game. What is the USP of your game? What is the one thing that people will fall in love with? and how to explain that thing, how to deliver the message about that thing to your potential and future consumers. What are the so-called RTBs, meaning reasons to believe, meaning the features that back up the initial USP that you have shaped? And what are the weak points of your game? This is something that we usually ignore and we shouldn't, because believe me, your game has some weak points. Every game has some weak, weak points. And if they exist, and they do exist, someone will ask the question sooner than later. And you should be prepared to give the best answer possible. So if you are aware of your weak points and you know how to address them, you shouldn't be worried about them as much. Then comes your audience, meaning the people, who are they? Where are they? How to reach them? How to communicate with them? How to engage them? And how to convert that engagement into sales later into the campaign? And then you've got the market, the overall environment of your game. A direct competition, but also the wider competition. Because even though you may have, like a, again, point-and-click adventure game or uh, top-down shooter or whatever. So you're going to compete with other top-down shooters or other point-and-click adventure games. But then those people will probably be interested in some other games as well. So maybe they, will, they will want to play a strategy game at the same time. So you should be aware of all of those things. Not every and each of those things is equally important for you, but you should at least have like a mediocre perception about what is happening on the market. And when it comes to your direct competition, to your like closest environment, you have to know absolutely everything or close to everything. And then you've got the whole thing that is following that up. What is the strength of the market? What are the sales numbers? What, are, what, what is the average pricing? How much should you charge for your games? Uh, is 19 euros enough? Is it too much or is it too, too little? Considering all the things, your investment, but also like the perception of your game on the market, if people are willing to spend that much money for your game and so, what, uh, and so, and so on and so forth. Then the life cycle. Should you think like really long term or maybe you should focus on this short term, very dynamic, very strong campaign that will just create initial buzz push some copies to the market so you could meet the break even point then start earning money but your game maybe it is a type of the game that will not will not last for long or maybe it is a game that you're going to update for years and you should prepare for that as well so those questions should be asked by you or by your marketing team and you have you should prepare some kind of answers and the success ratio this is a tricky part because 
basically you have to define what the success for you would be what numbers do you want to achieve how will you measure the success ratio for your game when will you be satisfied with your campaign and with your results those things you have to know prior to the campaign so you would be able to evaluate it on the go okay so having all of those things covered you should be good to go not having them covered maybe you are not destined to fail bar but your chance to fail is like increasing just a bit but this is just the first part and the second part is more sort of crazy i suppose because second part is about uh, marketing schizophrenia so being a marketing guy in game dev right now and being a creator of any kind in game dev right now you have to be a bit schizophrenic not in a like here is johnny way but still there is some kind of a schizophrenia be behind it because having one strength is not enough anymore when it comes to games so you have to cover all of the uh, all of the areas and of each aspect of your game should be good enough to compete on the market but on top of that having all of those areas covered you should cherry pick one thing that you're gonna own one thing that you're gonna like build your advantage on that it's gonna be exceptional in your case much better than in all of the games that are competing with you on the market it can be one thing only but you have to have that one thing you have to focus on that thing but you have to cover all of the, all of the other things production wise as well because having as i said before having good game is a commodity right now it's like in the hollywood industry right so sure every michael bay movie looks amazingly good every michael bay movie is exceptionally well made but that is true for all the blockbusters that out there and when it comes to games having like beautifully looking game is not enough anymore having a game that is like controlling really well is not enough anymore because people are expecting that right now this is something that we feel is natural if I buy a new game it should control well the gameplay should be fun Th those are the things that are quite obvious for me as a consumer where is the advantage where is this USP that I have uh, that I have mentioned and all of the games that are breaking that rule are doing that to achieve certain goal not because of the lack of effort or the lack of skills of the developers behind those games so for example that game which is undertale, undertale perfect so undertale does not look like god of war the newest one at least but there is a reason behind it they they were like chasing a particular tonality and particular feeling and they wanted to obtain like a particular effect with that kind of an approach and the same stays for Virginia Virginia is the title that I personally I like it very much and it's simplified looked look is out there and the game looks how it looks just because they wanted to like create a certain tonality for the game they wanted to create a certain look and feel and this is the reason they followed that particular path so what I'm trying to say is that you should under promise over the over deliver and you should understand all the rules before breaking them so if you are not sure if you want to risk being very edgy and being very like indie and non-standard of sort try to cover all the uh, all the areas and then on top of that using that as your foundation foundation sorry try to build on that and create that one advantage you're gonna own on the market yeah that's that okay and when it comes to the communication and this is the part that is especially schizophrenic so when it comes to the development side of things you have to cover all the areas that is hard but that is necessary for you but then when it comes to the marketing side of things you have to be very single-minded so even though all the areas are gonna be covered pretty much you have to focus on one thing you're gonna have to say one things you're gonna use 
as your premise. Use as something that people will remember, will remember and people will fall in love with. Because your message has to stick with its simplicity, with its clarity and appeal. Of course, you have to be clever communication-wise. But your message shouldn't be a thinker. It should be something quite obvious. Think about the clarity. People won't like, think long about your campaign, your slogans, your taglines, your trailers, and whatnot. They want to jump in, have the best experience possible, and jump out. And hopefully, after they jump out from your mini marketing experience, they're going to take something with them. And I'm going to take a sip of water. And then I'm going to follow with an example of sort. And this example is especially important for me. Because it is about Frostpunk. So Frostpunk, as I have mentioned before, this is a game that we have released like a few weeks back, I suppose. And Frostpunk, for those of you that do not know the game, Frostpunk is a city building game. But also... Frostpunk, it's a survival game, but also Frostpunk, it's a resource management game. And there is an exploration of sort that is possible in the game. And there is lawmaking, law and there is morality of sort, hard choices you have to make. There is a bunch of things that all together create quite coherent and allow me to say unique experience, but even though all of those legs that Frostpunk firmly stands on are out there. Marketing-wise, we have focused on one thing and one thing only, which is society survival. And of course, along the campaign, quite long campaign, especially for an indie game, but this is another topic that would demand additional two hours. But during our campaign, we have explained everything there is about Frostpunk. All the aspects have been covered. But we have talked about them and we have presented them from the point of view that is directly connected to society survival. So everything was communicated through the lens of society survival. And because of that, the coherency of the communication was really tight, I would say. And because of that, it was clear people were interested in society survival. They could focus about that. And that was something that we used as a lever of sort to leverage the upcoming messages. And maintaining that tonality was crucial for us, not only on the communication level, but then also on the level of branding, on the level of asset production, marketing asset production, and the presentation of the game itself. You can see some key visuals here. And as you can see, the palette, the color palette, the tonality, and the overall look and feel on each of each and every one of them, even though every scene presents something else and was connected to different aspects of the game, there is like a common shared foundation for all of them. And then you've got in-game assets. And we have, again, we took the same approach for every and each one of them. Even though, again, we are presenting different things on those screens, we are maintaining one tonality. And this is because branding, I mean, game, your game is a brand is a product that has to fight on a very competitive market. So it should have all of the aspects of a brand pretty much covered, and meaning the USP, the tonality, all of the things that are true for every other brand and every other product, no matter the category out there, those things should be covered for your game as well. Because your game is like Honda, your game is like Ikea, your game is like Head and Shoulders. That said, it's way more awesome. But still, it is a brand. So that branding, that foundation, that communication, fo communication foundation should be used by you and your 
like team members, to prepare a campaign plan afterwards. So it should be, it should be like a firm foundation, and on top of that foundation, you should build like shorter or long-term communication plan for your game. Because otherwise, as I said, it's going to be hard for you to like achieve sa satisfying numbers. And of course, there is a chance that when all the stars favor you and all the gods favor you, and then you've got a bit of luck on top of that, you can make a proper, you can create a proper success out there without those things covered. But if I were you, I wouldn't count on it because usually having that part covered is a must. So you should cover the, the whole journey end to end, everything in one coherent, with one coherent approach. And then, Please do remember that, and of course you are aware of that, that especially being an indie, your budget is very, very limited. So the budget usually makes things uh, a bit challenging, I would say, because even though you have uh, like a bunch of ideas you would like to put into motion, a bunch of ideas that you, you, you would like to bring to life to win the hearts of your consumers, you cannot afford to do everything just to the, like, money-related uh, limitations, but also the limitations that are related to the like scheduling and all of the other things. But then, when it comes to the budget itself, there is a way that you can estimate it. And having that number is especially important when you are planning things that you want actually to bring to life. And your budget, like the estimated one, would be the price of your game, the one that you want to like put out there, I would say, times 75% due to the Steam cut, because probably you're gonna, or any other platform cut, but let's focus on Steam right now, times 85 due to the taxes, times 60, and this is something that is worth remembering, because you shouldn't estimate your budget on your initial price, because the price is going to fluctuate, right? Even though at the beginning, of its life cycle, your game will be like 1999. Considering that the whole cycle, that the whole life cycle of the game, the price is gonna drop at some point. You're gonna have sales. You're gonna like have this long-term decrease of uh, of price and whatnot. So you should assume that 60% of the initial price that is going to be an average price of your game times the number of copies sold. That number minus the development cost will give you your marketing cap, will give you an amount that is your maximum amount that you should spend on marketing. And then, having that number, you should apply that number to the timeline of your campaign. Usually, it's going to be something in between six to nine months. When you are an indie developer, it shouldn't be more than six. But it, it shouldn't be much shorter, because you need that time to build the follow-up, to create some kind of a following, some kind of a hype. And again, this is the simplified chart that I have created for Frostpunk for the sake of this presentation. And we had like four major steps, four major phases. I'm going to kill myself in a second. Four major phases of the campaign, starting with teasing phase, uh, then the announcement of the game happened, then we had the phase in which we were like building the awareness and we were explaining all the features of the game and that was the longest part. We focused on creating the buzz, explaining the USP and letting people know and explaining to them why should they actually care about the game. Because, okay, you've got new FPS game or you've got new strategy game, why should I care as a consumer? There are so many FPS games, there are so many strategy games. Please tell me, you kind creator, why your game is something that I should care more about in comparison to all the other uh, games out there, either those games that already exist on the market or the games that are coming in your launch window. Then the launch window, window happened and we were focusing on creating, on converting all of those numbers, all of those things that we have obtained prior to that into actual sales because this is where the money comes into play, right? And then there is the post-release support because your campaign does not end 
with the launch of your game. Quite the opposite, I would say. Usually you have to follow up. Usually you have to keep the momentum. You have to like, keep the conversion high post-release, updating the game, communicating, thinking about how to prolong the life cycle of your game. And what is important and what we usually ignore as creators it, is that for every phase, and I'm not saying that this is the matrix that you should apply to every title. This is a simplified matrix, first of all, and then this is the one that we have created for that game, but usually you have to come up with, come up with your own. But then, however your matrix will look like, you should apply and define objectives that you want to meet for every and each of those phases, then the so-called KPIs, which are key performance indicators, meaning the indicators that you're going to use to evaluate your efficiency in that particular phase, and then obviously the budget split. How much money can you invest into each and every phase to meet the objectives in accordance to those KPIs? More or less it works like that. I have killed the presentation. Okay, it's there. So, and then the community. That's the obvious part, that you should cherish the community because everything costs money. So if something can be an organic part of your campaign, it is precious as hell. And we live in the age of early access, of Kickstarter, HIO, of Twitch, of influencers and all of those things that are very trendy right now. So ignoring those things is not a wise thing to do. And then there is a lot of things, a lot of ways to approach the matter, not to invest too much money into building your community. If it, took, it takes a lot of effort, obviously, but it can be done. So you should, you should absolutely focus on that on organic part versus paid part and proper timing. And the proper timing is especially important because, and I have already mentioned that to that degree, it is very important for you to build a proper following at least few months before your release. And to measure that and to control that, you can use a bunch of tools. You had the slide with social media monitoring tool, right? We are using, uh, what we are using right now is Brand24, but there is a bunch of tools that you can use to your advantage. The thing is that you should be aware of the fact if people are talking about your game or not, what the sentiment is, if those mentions are positive or negative or maybe may neutral, where are they talking, should you react or not, and so on and so forth. Then you got Google Trends, all of those things that you can use to your advantage just to see if you are doing your job in a proper way and if your, if your way of doing things gives you an upper hand over your competitors or not. And this is something, th this chart shows you the interest in Frostpunk. Uh, it, it is a Google Trends chart. And as you can see, this is the release day. Uh, oh no, it's not, but it's close to the release. But as you can see, we had like this constant growth due to all the things that we've been like in investing in and uh, due to all the releases that we have made and so on, just to have that proper following. Because even though your big spike on day one is important, it is not, and I have to stress it out, it is not as important as the long-term following prior to the release. And community management as the whole campaign planning it is a process. It takes time, but it is worth investing. Okay, so these are those five things and five things only that I wanted to cover today, uh, which is data management, product shaping, brand equality, and basically brand, brand uh, design, campaign planning, and community management. And this is a foundation, only a foundation, but having those parts covered you can increase your chances on the market. It won't guarantee you anything, absolutely, but it will increase, increase your chance. So consider that a good start for your uh, campaign planning. And one thing that is quite important, especially for indie side of things, I suppose, is that 
if you want to self-publish, if you want to do everything on your own, you should incorporate those things into your tasks, upcoming tasks of sort. But if you have a publisher, push your publisher to the limit because he is the one that should deliver those things. And do not get me wrong, you're going to be involved and you have to be involved because you are the one that knows your game inside out. You are the one that knows what is the most precious aspect of your game, what should be stressed out and so on and so forth. But marketing know-how and publishing know-how, this is something that your publisher should bring to the table and this is something that your publisher should cover when it comes to the formal things but also to the meritorical things. Okay, so keep your hands on the wheel but demand as much as you can from your publisher. Okay guys, so this is all from my side right now. If you want to stay in touch, this is my Twitter handle. I'm gonna post my presentation today or tomorrow, probably tomorrow, just if you want to download it or like read it through or whatever. Uh, there isn't, someone told me that I have to tell you that there is an app of sort, like a digital dragon app, and in that app you can rate my presentation if you want to. Uh, I would be happy if you did, because it is always good to know if I gave a shitty talk or not. And if you have any questions, you can either ask them right now, or we can meet afterwards. I'm gonna like hang around somewhere here. And later, I'm going to be at the party, probably, not for long, because I'm the most boring guy ever. Thank you very much for your presence here, and I'm waiting for the questions to appear. Thank you, guys. Oh. Yeah.